A professional counselor in the Dallas area is growing in popularity for his treatment methods. How do you talk to kids about tarot? And with social media and television, it's everywhere and it's unavoidable for kids. Rusty Lozano is the founder of the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. He's also been nationally recognized for his work with brain mapping. He's created a gym to work out the mind. His office features an obstacle course. Rusty Lozano is a licensed professional counselor, helping children with headaches, with anxiety, ADHD, and more. Here's where Lozano comes in. He teaches kids how to think their pain away with something called biofeedback. A North Texas therapist is treating patients in this unconventional way. We have Rusty Lozano who's joining us today. He's a licensed professional counselor. He put together an unusual treatment for teenagers who are struggling with mental issues, except he's taking this now a step further. Rusty Lozano, a leading uh, therapist and uh, pediatric biofeedback therapist based in Texas at the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. And uh, Rusty, thanks for being with us tonight. Rusty Lozano, a father of four and also a professional counselor in Texas, says it's all about being a credible resource to your children. The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Your dedicated resource for mental health news, views, and tips you can use. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. And now, here's Rusty. Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. I am your host, and we are flying solo today. I've been meaning to do this for a while. Just going to get on the air and introduce myself and, and kind of talk a little bit about who I am and what I do and what some of my philosophies are about cognition, which is really the way that you think, emotional regulation, how to calm yourself down, how to, how to really use practical coping mechanisms to help you calm down, and then also uh, how to, to you know manage your physical responses. The reason I wanted to do this topic is because Earlier in the week, I actually had a situation where I had a bunch of kids inside of the pendulum. The pendulum is at the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. It's, it's, a, it's an indoor obstacle course that I have that I use to stress out kids, uh, mainly to, to see if like what we're teaching them is actually working, if they can actually use it, or if they're struggling and we need to revisit you know, some of the things that we've learned going back into a quiet environment in a room and um, and relearning how to use these strategies to help them feel more calm and relaxed. Uh, so I had a mom in a, that was in there and she was with her child and, and uh, this particular kiddo is, uh, she has a very strong rebellious reaction to her mother sometimes when, when she tells her to do something, calm herself down or gives her some sort of an instruction uh, you know, this child has a tendency to immediately knee-jerk reaction, you know, say something to the mom and have a negative reaction, uh, negative emotional response. And, um, and earlier in that day, actually, um, we had that child plus about 10 others that were inside of the gym. And so what we're trying to do is provoke these kids to have some sort of stress response. And, uh, and actually what ended up happening is the mom got bit and she came out, she goes, this is impossible. There's so many kids in here. You know, it's not even working. She couldn't even actually have, she couldn't even take turns. She couldn't, uh, get on the swings. They were just standing around. It was really difficult. And I was like, but that's exactly what I'm trying to, to create here. You know, I'm actually trying to create a situation that is not conventional. Uh, you can't train and you can't learn to control re- your reactions in a quiet environment. And so the mom was actually getting bit by the place. And I call, I call it getting bit because you have these emotional reactions that, um, that it usually spawns from frustration. It's like I, I guess that I'm in the business of just frustrating people <laughs> and seeing what they can do to calm themselves down. Well, you know, in the course of, of she you know, ex- expressing like what her disdain was about this process, I told her you know, this isn't a conventional way of doing things. You know, I actually, I, this is what I want. I want the chaos. I want there to be disorder. I want there to be a lot of this uh, uh, mayhem inside of the room, controlled chaos, because I want to see what these kids do. And then whenever I kind of cue a response from the distance, like with the microphone, and I ask them to use a breathing technique to calm themselves down or use a body technique to calm themselves down, I want to see how well they can actually use it. 
And are they able to, or do I need to remove them from that environment and go back and do some work? And so I think that, you know, she started to kind of understand a little bit about what I was saying, but then there was an aha moment when I told her, look at your child now. And this is the same one who was actually, uh, she didn't want to get involved. She was scared on the wall uh, and, and was afraid to kind of interact with these kids. And then all of a sudden, she's out there. She's out there on the pendulum, moving around kids, saying, excuse me, coming through and laughing and having a really good time. And now it's like, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach these children how to uh, manage their emotions and, and actually learn through experience. Because she's going to remember that particular, uh, that particular montage of training more than she will if we rehearsed it with words. So that was the point. You know, and that's the point of like the center. So what I want to do today is I want to just disclose and really help give some practical coping mechanisms for anybody who is struggling with anxiety, anybody who is struggling with anger, anybody who is struggling with uh, emotional issues like uh, sadness, depression, uh, rage, um, you know, uh, any of the ones that have like such an encompassing response that will hamper your quality, your daily living, the quality of life that you have. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to you about cognitive perception, like what is perception. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to disassociate the emotions. And this sounds like a lot of co- like psychological babble, but I'll, I'll break these down into uh, very practical, understandable concepts. And then we're going to discuss physiological and emotional responses. So let's jump right in a little bit and kind of talk about cognitive perception and what perception is. Perception is thought, what your beliefs are. Right now, if you're in a car or right now if you're in your living room or you're um, out in the yard or you're, whatever you're, wherever you are, and you look around you and you see the world, you see a bunch of cars going by and on the highway, you see the trees, you see a blue sky, uh, there's something about the way that you're seeing those things and in on your understanding of what you're seeing and the perception, that's the, that's what you're seeing and the meaning it gives to you. So if I'm looking at a blue sky and green trees and birds that are chirping outside, that's to me is comforting and relaxing. And so the experience that I'm going to take from that visual is that it makes me feel good. Now, that's a very basic way of trying to understand what perception is. Um, let's talk about then what happens when you induce emotions. Have you ever had the feeling that somebody's trying to provoke some sort of an emotional reaction out of you? Um, like they're purposely trying to hurt you, manipulate you. Uh, they're trying to spite you. And their intentions may be negative and it's actually designed to create some sort of uh, a negative emotional reaction from you. And we get this a lot. Sometimes you read people's tendencies or their intentions as very negative, as they're trying to do something to hurt you. Uh, Sometimes those particular thoughts are valid and you, I mean, it's true. Maybe they really are trying to upset you. Sometimes it's preemptive. Preemptive means that you're jumping to conclusions and you're misunderstanding or perhaps you're misunderstanding what the intention is behind their, their interaction with you. And so then that then invokes an emotional response. How can you actually control that? How can you control and actually manage to identify what intention is? Are they trying to hurt me or am I being too sensitive? This is where the whole basis of cognitive perception comes from, and that is that you're going to try to figure out a way to understand what you're seeing, and then before you react to it, you're going to try to control the way that you understand what you're seeing by first halting your behavioral reaction, which is then to control your body. And that's where we're going to go further into understanding the connection between the way that you think the way that you feel, and then the, the way that you're going to behave about those two components. 
And so uh, that's one of the things I think is really important is in being able to lear- learn to self-regulate and control your emotions, uh, you're going to be able to first have a barometer for yourself. And if you can actually stump your reaction, then the thoughts are benign and they won't affect you. And we'll go into more detail as far as that, how that works. Um, but being in the field of biofeedback, I think that one of the, I've picked up a few things just from my own personal experiences uh, that I've read about and has actually helped me to you know, emphasize how well um, keep, it can be actually learned and transferred over to other people. It doesn't have to be too heady and too difficult to you know, try to understand. It's actually very, very simple to control your emotional reaction. Let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano, brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, and welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm spending some time flying solo today. I'm spending some time identifying thoughts, physiological reactions, and behavioral response, how to manage your symptoms such as anxiety, anger, depression, uh, and I guess like uh, you know any of the un, unforeseen emotional responses we have and experience day to day. So our entire existence consists of you know things that we we see and we understand. That's perception. We talked about that in the first segment, and then there's a physiological response. So if let's just, I use the example, so if we're in a boat and uh, we're sitting in the middle of the ocean, and there are sharks surrounding us. We'd be terrified. And we'd be looking out on the side of the, the boat and, like, seeing, you know, if they're going to get in or they, they're going to sink. I mean, we're in danger. We have to survive. So that's a belief, and then it's tied into a physiological response. That physiological response is known as the fight-or-flight response. That is when your pupils dilate, breathing becomes very rapid, muscles tense up, blood pulls back from the extremities, hands begin to sweat, so this is the fight or flight response. That fight or flight response, we only would tap into this particular mechanism in the primordial days. If we're running away from a saber toothed cat, or we have to uh, evade some kind of danger, so we fight it off or we flee from it. So that's the physiological manifestation. And so then, what you're seeing is provoking this emotional reaction. So if you can control then the emotional or the um, the physiological response. And that's, what, that's what's actually driving the emotion. That is the stress that's happening in the body. So how do you calm yourself down? So there are, you hear about all different kinds of ways that people do this. Uh, you can either take a walk or you can smash something or you can have a drink or, um, you know, use any sort of recreational drugs or prescription drugs. So there are ways that we actually try to manage that particular manifestation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best way. Um, first, we have to understand what's happening in the body. If we're aware that there's a lot of stress, if we're aware that we're actually undergoing some kind of strong physiological reaction, then there's a way that we can undo that response. And part of that way is that we can use some relaxation strategies. And so what we teach is controlled breathing and body drops. Right now, I'm sitting in this chair and I have my leg propped up and this, my lower body from the hips to the toes, they're completely shut down. So there's not any movement coming from my hips to the toes. It's just completely dead weight. What is that doing? Well, physiologically, what's happening is your brain has all of these sensors all over the body. It can detect temperature. It can detect hunger. It can detect tiredness. If you need to use the restroom, if the room is too cold. So... A lot of things that your your brain is actually going to understand about the outside world is done through these sensors in the body. So you use eyes to see, uh, your breathing, and so your skin has all these perceptors on it. So if you want to learn to really control your and manage your emotions, this physiological component is very, very important. Um, if you can actually turn your body into a wet noodle and release your muscles in the arms release the muscles in your legs, release the muscles in your face, then what ends up happening is all of a sudden these sensors that have been tripping this 
strong reaction, muscles are tensing up, your breathing is becoming very you know, inundated, all of a sudden they're shut off, well, then it's going to take about, about a 10, 15 second swing in order for your emotions to shift. And whatever the state is, whether it be fear, whether it be anger, that will eventually change. Uh, so I actually figured this out uh, riding the Superman at Six Flags with my daughter 64 times one summer. Uh, this is when the flash pass over at Six Flags was very, very fast, and you could get in line. And I was just kind of, I was in my younger days, I was uh, able to really handle that. Um, so the first time we got onto this ride, I was terrified. I don't like those dropping uh, thrill rides. I, I like roller coasters. But she wanted to get on, so did what she wanted to do. So uh, here we are. We're actually, we're, you know, if you're not familiar with the Superman at Six Flags, it's these, it's a cylinder that shoots up. It's a little ring that shoots up a cylinder. I don't know, something like uh, 30 stories or something like that. Um, and then it drops you. It free falls you. And then you go to the top, and then it shoots you down like a yo-yo. And so I remember the very first time I got on this thing, I had this intense tickle sensation. You know that tickling sensation you get when you, you know, have a drop on a roller coaster or something? Um, well, I had that, and it took my breath away, and it was really intense, and it kind of made the experience ultra thrilling, right? I didn't like it. Uh, but she wanted to get on again, and so over the course of the night, we got on eight times. And so the very first time, I had a very strong you know, emotional, or I guess like this physiological reaction, muscles are tight, breathing was inundated. I was really, really like tickly, didn't like it. My anxiety was through the roof. And then over the course of the next three or four, all of a sudden I didn't feel anything. I was relaxing into it. My body was limp. My arms were limp. My legs were limp. And so as we'd shoot up, the only thing I felt was air, like drifting past me. And then all of a sudden I had this view of the entire like landscape, you know, this the cityscape of Arlington. You see the ballpark in Arlington. It's pretty neat. So, you know, we're, we're actually on this ride, and so, you know, the experience had changed. And then I was unfortunate enough to actually turn, and I was facing one of the other silos on one of those rides. And I was facing, you know, this mechanical uh, monstrosity of wires, of bolts and grease slicks and i'm like oh man this is pretty man-made and uh yeah this this thing looks like it could actually break and so all night i'd actually been just fine without feeling anything and then i looked over at the silo and all of a sudden when we shot up into the air like all these tickle sensations came back and i thought to myself what just happened why is this experience different than the other five that i just had and it was because my thoughts now we're interfering with my physiological response. You see, when you think about something, overly think about it, and then you have a physical reaction to it, that becomes a reality. That becomes an emotional experience. Shark on the boat. That becomes something that, you know, if you think about, you know, somebody trying to provoke negativity in you or a situation provokes impatience, that is the combination of thought and phys physiological manifestations. That's perception. That's a reality. And that's the basis of how we experience the world. We're very, sens we're very sensate in nature, um, and that is that we experience things through our senses. Um, so that physiological component is really, really important to be able to manage and control. So let's say that we're talking to uh, any, somebody who has anger issues or somebody who has anxiety. Let's stick with anger. Anger is a pretty easy one, and we all experience that from time to time. So let's say that you're having a disagreement at home uh, with a family member or a disagreement with your boss or a partner or whatever the situation. So you're thinking about, you're hearing what they're saying, and all of a sudden, like, you're getting worked up. Your breathing gets really tight, you're really inundated. Your muscles get really tight. All of a sudden, you feel really physically uncomfortable. And it's because of something that they said. And all of a sudden, the conversation that they're having has no clear, it, has, it makes no sense at all. They're not getting any points to you. You're obsessing about what you're about to say and how you're about to respond. So that physiological component is now starting to kind of play into this entire experience. So here's what happens then. If you want to change it, just like I was on the Superman at Six Flags, 
you have to learn to control the body. If you can control your body, then you can control your experience. You can control that particular thought that's provoking the emotional response. How do you do it? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, The most basic way that you can actually learn to manage these emotions is by using your breathing. Something as simple as that. You know, the body only needs two things. It needs nutrition and it needs air. So if all of a sudden you feel yourself getting upset and you're physically uncomfortable, if you change the way that you breathe, then all of a sudden, like, you will start to shift out of this response. And that is that the breathing is the gas pedal to the body. If you're breathing very rapidly, your body's going to go in a very rapid state. If you slow your breathing down, then your body will begin to slow down and feel more relaxed. And so if you can, if timing and your awareness, you can actually catch that response and, and not ride the wave, as we call it. And that means that if you're riding the wave, you're essentially, um, you're, you're just kind of being blown around by the wind, like a leaf being blown around by the wind. But if you can catch, okay, I feel uncomfortable, catch yourself. And all of a sudden, change the way that you're feeling, change your body. Then the response will begin to sway away and it'll fade. And that's what we call physiological uh, coping mechanisms. So you calm your body down. Just like my body was calm when I was on that Superman at Six Flags, and all of a sudden all the thrilling tickle sensations went away. If there's no physical response, then there's a very low or no emotional reaction. And all of a sudden, like your thoughts become benign and they become less threatening to how you're feeling in the body. And so that's the, the gym exercise that I was actually, or the gym episode I was explaining earlier with the mom who was actually, she came out and she was upset and she was worked up because she had all this stuff going on, all these kids. And that's the point is that we want it to be crazy, but she got bit. She was bit by that place because all of a sudden she was overwhelmed and she was worked up. And so that's the whole point of that response. So if you can learn to control your body, then you can learn. That's the, the basis of learning to control your emotions. No reaction, no show. So if your body is calm and still and you can manage how you're feeling, then you can manage your thoughts and you can manage how you're about to respond. Going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, we're back. If you're just joining us, I'm flying solo today. I wanted to share with you more about who I am and what my philosophy of regulation and how to really use practical coping mechanisms for everyday stress, whether it be anger, anxiety, depression. So what we've been doing, or what I've been doing, is using cognitive, separating out all the different components that really drive an emotional response. There's a cognitive component or a thought process. I think something is happening right now. I see this happening and I don't, I don't agree with it. There's a physiological response, and now I feel uncomfortable with it. This is upsetting me. This next segment is about behavioral. What am I going to do about it? So this is one that we typically see after the fact. If you start an argument or criticize, cuss out, spank, ground, take a drink, that's usually the offset and the the actual re- reaction or the response from the co- the thought and the physiological component. And now that's a behavioral response. So your behavior is what is unleashed from what you understood and how you reacted and then what it leads to. So how do you control that? Um, there are tons, there are tons and tons of books out there regarding you know, how to develop behavioral coping mechanisms, way to change your behavior. Uh, in my opinion, I think that it's really important to keep these other components in because conventional counseling can talk about your thoughts. Conventional counseling can talk about your behavior, how to change 
the behavior and what you could do. But the physiological in the middle is what's typically overlooked. So if we go back and look at those two components, the way that I'm thinking affects the way that I'm feeling, which is then going to affect my reaction. Then you have insight into how you can change behavior. So the behavioral response usually is one of one of these forms. There's avoidance, there's reactive, and then um, from those two, you have either your, your blown up emotional reactions. So that is going to be your anger, your anxiety. So if you can think about behavior as a way of, okay, this is what I feel like saying. There's a small window of time. There's a small window you have before you actually execute a reaction, execute your behavior. You know what you're about to say. You know what you're about to do. And if you can actually use that little time frame to redirect what you're, what, how and what you're going to say, then it makes a difference in everything. And it makes a difference in how the outcome is going to turn out. So let me give you a case in point. <clears throat> so I have uh, worked a lot with uh, individuals who have a fear of flying. And uh, one of the things that I used to actually do is go and we would find a pilot and we'd get inside of an airplane and we would desensitize the person's response to flying. So um, we'd be in, we'd sit inside of this twin engine airplane. This is one circumstance. I remember I was the one actually feeling a little bit anxious because I was sitting in the very back of the plane. And, uh, and I never know that airplanes actually do what's called a yaw and they wag its tail like a dog. And so I'm back there kind of moving side to side and I was having a, a pretty strong reaction to that, but I didn't, share it with anybody. Uh, But this one example that I have of a a patient that actually had a fear of flying, um, they had a cousin that passed away in a different state. And so he needed to go to the funeral. And, you know, obviously that was, it was a family member. It was an important event. And so um, he contacted me because he was driving around the terminal at DFW airport hitting the steering wheel and screaming because he could not bring himself to get on the airplane. And so uh, what ended up happening is he didn't go and he felt just completely miserable about, about that. So over the course of our training, um, his graduation exercise was to actually get on a, on an airplane and uh, see how well he could actually use techniques that he's learned to calm himself down. So, I have this biofeedback monitor hooked up to uh, his hand. It's measuring sweat activity. That's called uh, skin conductance. And so whenever we are undergoing some sort of autonomic state or intense stress, there's a lot of sweat that begins to secrete from the hands. And so there's a little monitor that's picking that up, and it feeds it into a computer screen, and you can see this line graph. And if the anxiety starts to rise, then the line graph will actually indicate that. And so uh, we were on the airplane, and he's sitting up at the co-pilot seat, and we were doing simulated takeoffs. So we are going down to the runway, and we would actually zoom from that uh, starting point where you have all those, like, lines that, you know, are where the airplane starts to rev up the engines to take off. I'm not an airplane mechanic or anything, but anyways, it's... Uh, And we would actually fly into the air about four or five feet and then come back down and land. And so the interesting thing is that I would think that, you know, I have, I'm on the microphone with him. I'm walking him through, you know, what he needs to do, how well he's doing, giving him consistent feedback about, you know, the state of his body. And so, um, you know, his behavioral reaction, his behavioral response was to feel very afraid. And he became, he suppressed, he was breathing very heavily muscle tension was really tight. And so I was instructing them, okay, loosen up your muscles, slow your breathing down. And so then what ended up happening is uh, his behavior had shifted. It had changed. When he said he he was like, he was about to pull the plug. He says, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, He knew, and he knew what he was actually feeling and he knew what I was instructing him to do. And he actually had an opportunity. He had a small glimpse. He took the opportunity to, do something different, and he calmed down. And so what ended up happening is he learned something new. His brain learned something new. 
and that is that when he was actually uh, about to f- to flip out and like say stop, I, I want to get out, that he worked his way through that. He didn't respond to it, and so then the behavior shifted, and his confidence went way up. He felt comfortable. He had an aha moment. Ah, right, this isn't so bad. I can do this. And so uh, we did the simulated takeoff, and then we landed. And I gave him feedback on you know how he's doing, and I'm like, man, you're doing great. You're really just you're you're doing an excellent job of this. And then he turned over and looked at me, and he said, "Well, can we go ahead and can we do can we take off and fly around a little bit?" And I looked over at the pilot, and he says, "Whatever you want to do." And so we uh, ended up taking off, and we did we circled around the airstrip, and this is where I was kind of freaking out and back as you know his ex like wagon back and forth. So I was like. I don't like to fly. Um, and so uh, his, his experience then changed, it shifted. And that was learning in the moment. And if you can actually catch that, you think to yourself, if you can change your behavior in the face of something that's stressing you out, you learn something. Your body, your brain will collaborate. And all of a sudden, like you've created a new association or a new learning experience. And so from that, you will be able to uh, build on it, you know, and it's a point of reference. And, uh, and I use these point of references. I always prefer them as like the, the birthday moments. A point of reference is a memory moment, you know, and that's like uh, if I were to say to you, uh, hey, so-and-so is having a birthday party, and uh, you'd say, well, okay, yeah, that sounds fun. Let's go. Well, how do you know what to expect when somebody says that? Well, you know, there's going to be a birthday cake. There's probably going to be barbecue, uh, people, you know, friends, good time. So you've had those experiences before, and you can rely on them. You see, when you're contending with behavior, you're dealing with a lot of things that are are unknown, and you're not very comfortable with that. You you know, a lot of people really like to try to control the outcome, control their immediate immediate environment, immediate outcome to things. And, uh, and they don't like to deviate, and that's why we have disagreements. But if you can evolve yourself and be open to these newer learning experiences and newer learning opportunities, you grow and you develop, and all of a sudden th- those things become less disheartening. They become less stressful, just like this particular patient who called me from Chicago one day years later he says, hey, guess what? Guess where I am? And he told me about his entire experience uh, flying, you know, and, and he's been doing it for a while now. And he said, I forgot to tell you, and I wanted to say thank you. I'm like, man, that is great news. It is just fantastic. So you can build on those. So behavior is one of those things where it feels uncomfortable at that moment and at the onset. And that's what drives us to have such a strong reaction to it, anger, anxiety arguing, avoidances. But if we can actually change our perception a little bit, change our experience by expanding and saying, okay, let me try your perspective. Let me let this go. Let me kind of go with the flow and see what happens. And then you never know. You end up actually learning something that you weren't intending or planning on, and that's behavior. And so um, it's, uh, it, it really is a matter of just letting go in order to change the behavior. So um, food for thought, but you know, it's, it's uh it sounds simple to do, but I think that it takes you experiencing it and not hearing it from somebody else. I'm a counselor. And so um, part of my job is that I, I listen and um, I don't give advice, but I reflect and I will kind of direct to some uh, co- ways that you can cope or try, try out some new skills. So I can't, tell you to divorce your wife. I can't tell you to, um, to move out and, you know, give you like pretty hard advice. It's life changing. Those are decisions that have to be made on your own. But what I can do is give you some information, some new information that you can actually try out. And if it works, then you've completely evolved yourself and you now have a brand new set of skills. And isn't that what we're always trying to accomplish? Aren't we always trying to learn something new? It's easier than you think. We're going to take a commercial break. We'll be right back after these messages. 
You're listening to The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hi, we're back. Thank you for joining me. I'm flying solo today on The Therapy Hour. And if you're just joining us, I'm discussing uh, thoughts, physical reactions, and behaviors. And with this last segment, what I'd like for you to do is let's tie this concept together. What I'd like for you to do is take out a piece of paper and draw three big circles on it. And they don't have to, and you're going to stack them one over the other. They don't have to interlink. It's not what it's about. Just three circles, one on top, one in the middle, one on the bottom. In the first circle, I want you to write thoughts. In the second circle, I want you to write physical. In the third circle, I want you to write behavioral. Okay. Now, this is a way that we're going to tie in everything that I've talked about tonight from controlling your thoughts or identifying your thoughts to uh, understanding your physical reaction to then the behavioral response that comes afterwards. So if you have these three circles on your paper, if from the thoughts circle, you draw a little arch from thoughts to physical, it's going to look like kind of like a little rainbow. It's going to connect. So it's feeding in. One is feeding into the other. And so then from physical, you're going to draw another little arch and you're going to tie in behavior. Okay. And then from the other side, you can do the same thing. Arch going from thoughts to physical. And then physical will go into behavioral. Okay. So this is the manifestation. This is how thinking, physical reaction, and behavioral responses feed into each other. It starts out with a thought. Then there's a physical response. And there's a behavior. I'm going to give you an example of, of myself when I was in college. I, I dreaded studying. I had a roommate that was actually really good at it. And what he would do is... He would, as soon as school was out, he would go directly, he'd go back to our apartment and he would do his work. And so then he would be finished around like six, seven, eight o'clock at night with all of his homework for the night. And then he would come home. Oh, actually he'd go out uh, while I was coming home. So I'd already try to find something to do because I was bored. And as I was actually coming home to do homework, he was leaving for the night, which made me want to turn around and go leave with him and say, Hey, where are you going to go hang out at? But I had work to do. So he left, and I'm sitting here with a pile of work on my desk. And I have books that I need to read. I have notes that I need to review. And so my thoughts at that particular point was, ah, I had to do all of this work. I really don't want to do it. My physical response was to avoid it. So my physical response was to actually feel uncomfortable with it Sorry, not avoid it, but feel uncomfortable with it. And, you know, just uh, just the thought of having to do that made me feel uncomfortable. My behavioral response then was to avoid it. So if I heard a friend outside the door or if I was, you know, heard people out in the, cause in, uh, out in the, in the foyer and they're actually hanging out, people were always outside hanging out. I would actually get up and say, hey, go say hello. So as a way of avoiding it. So... Thoughts feed into the physical response. Physical response feeds into the behavioral response. And it is a, um, a vicious cycle. Let's say that I can try to control my thinking. And I say, okay, well, I really have to sit down and do it. But then there's a physical response that's saying, I don't want to. I don't feel comfortable with this. Uh, and then the behaviors, I want to avoid it. Or let's say that I even actually uh, make myself sit down so I control my physical response but then the thought is, the thought is still activating. I don't want to do this. And then my behavior is that I'm kind of dragging my, my feet to be able to get serious about this. So that thought, that component then, there's one way that you can short circuit that process because they will continue to bounce from one thing to another. Your thinking will bounce from your thoughts to a reaction to then a behavior, which is what are you going to do about it? So... One of the best ways to control this is to draw on your paper, draw a huge X and X out physical. So if you can X that out, 
all of a sudden, you're left with the two circles, which is thoughts and behavior. If you can control, and this goes back to that second segment, if you can control your physical response, then the thinking and the behavior are much, much more manageable. So to tie all of this, con- to tie this in, this concept about you know, learning to manage your emotions, learning to self-regulate, learning to control and use effective coping mechanisms, it's going to come from learning to control your physical reaction. I have this marionette at my office. It's a, it's a, um, what is it? It's a, well, Pinocchio, sorry. I had a blank, a blank brain there for a second. It's a Pinocchio and he's, it's a little marionette doll on strings. And, um, and so I always use this as a prop in my office and I'll lay the Pinocchio down and his body's loose. The arms are loose, legs are loose. And I kind of demonstrate that by lifting up the little legs, lifting up the little arms and saying, look, this is what you're here to learn. And if you can control your physical response, then the thoughts and the behaviors are a lot more manageable. So this is, this is what I recommend that you do. So for those of you who struggle with anger, those of you who struggle with anxiety, those of you who struggle with avoidances, sadness, any one of those, so if you can control your physical response by using a couple of these steps, and uh, these are just little simple recommendations, slow your breathing down. I call them into threes, out to threes. If you can slow, breathe in to the count of three, breathe out to the count of three, that's called an into three, out to three. The other thing that I recommend that you might want to try is to take a deep breath and hold it for the count of 10, 10 seconds, and then exhale, and then take three deep breaths. What that does is physiologically, it fills your bloodstream with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is one of those elements in, in you know, uh, the air molecules, our body can't absorb it. You know, when you breathe in air from outside, you're breathing in oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, helium, a variety of different air molecules. And uh, you have these little tiny cell-like uh, dendrils inside of your lungs called cilia. And when you breathe in, the cilia open and they grab an air molecule and then it sends it down the bloodstream. When you breathe out, those little cilia open, and they release waste, which is carbon dioxide. A big part of it is carbon dioxide. So if you take a deep breath and you're holding it, then what you're doing is that little cilia inside of the lungs, they open to release the waste, and they remain open waiting for a car, a, an oxygen molecule, an oxygen air molecule, and so what they'll end up doing is grabbing a carbon dioxide molecule and sending it back down into the bloodstream. And then all of a sudden, your brain is so preoccupied with thinking about what you're, you're freaking out about. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're obsessing about it. You're worried about it. And all of a sudden, like, the air quality changes inside of your body, and your brain says, what the heck? What's going on? And so what ends up happening is it drops that idea. It drops the emotional stimulus or the cognitive stimulus, the thought, and then it turns to expel all the carbon dioxide from the bloodstream. And that is a great way to, to stop your thinking because you're, you're going to feel it's going to do two things for you. It's going to make you feel really calm and relaxed. And it's also going to keep your mouth shut so you don't say anything you're going to regret and get in deeper water. So that coping mechanism is a simple one that you can use to help you the other thing I'd recommend that you work on doing is think about your body as having three zones. Top of the head to your shoulders is zone one. Shoulders to the hips is zone two. Hips to the toes is zone three. One, two, three zones. So if you, at any given moment, feel upset, if you can drop those zones a lot like you do, like, like how I do with that little marionette puppet, string puppet, you just drop the strings All of a sudden, your arms are loose, your legs are loose, your face is loose. Then what you're doing is you're creating this physical reaction that is not feeding into the stress. It's not feeding into the uh, anxiety or uh, the emotional state that you're in. And so it counters it. Your body will begin to shift, and you'll move from this stress state into something that's a little bit more benign, relaxed state. 
I mean, there's only two modes. There's a, there's a stress mode. It's the fight or flight response. And then there's the relaxation mode, which is uh, what's called the parasympathetic response. And so we have those two speeds. And so what you're doing is you're creating what's called a parasympathetic dominant state or a relaxed state. No reaction, no show. So if you can keep your body relaxed, you can regulate and control your breathing, then you have a powerful tool to be able to control your thinking, your physical response, and your behaviors. So that's the the basis of self-regulation through a, an approach called peripheral bowel feedback. It's one of my favorites. Um, and I've worked with some of the best uh, pioneers, I mean, some of the biggest pioneers in the field of biofeedback, and I've learned a lot, asked a lot of questions, and, uh, and that stuck my nose in a lot of books. And, you know, you have all of this information, but you know what it really takes to learn something is to be around it so much, to be around it all the time. And then all of a sudden, like, you can, you, you these little experiences happen, and you're like, oh, I read about this, I remember... Uh, reading what I what had just experienced, and you know, it's actually this makes sense to me now. So, uh, when it comes to changing your thinking and controlling your body and controlling your behavior, it is a st- uh, you have to think about it that way. You've lived a, an, your entire life having all these experiences, uh, and if you want to create new ones, that's how you offset negative experiences. Go out and like. Have new experiences. Go out and do new things. Stretch your ability to withstand something new. And, uh, and, and what that will eventually do over the course of time is it will make you a stronger person. This is Rusty Lozano. Thank you for joining me on the Therapy Hour. Have a great day.